webinar. Oh my goodness. What happened? It, uh, it puts you into uh, the screen share. So we have people who are joining us, but it looks like we are going to be the only ones that um, that you can see. So we've got about 60 people online so far. As you're joining folks, um, we're going to get started in just a minute. I know that there was an old link that was out there. So we're going to take an extra minute or two to make sure that everybody's able to join with the correct link. So if you need to give your dog a bully stick, go for a last minute potty break for humans or for dogs, um, now is the time to do it. Um, and if you have questions or anything else like that, just put them in the Q&A section for me. Um, I will be the one monitoring that. So if you need anything, just holler at me there. My dog is like, I have finished destroying the snuffle mat. What else can I do? I know. Now what? That's a great question. Yeah. Your life is not that hard. I know. You're so cute. I just got informed. Uh, one of my friends wanted to make sure participant video was off because she is in her robe. So uh, you're welcome. I'm calling you out publicly. Um, Yes, participant videos are off. So if you're uh, in your robes, if your dogs are in their robes, you are totally fine. Um, as I mentioned, we're just going to give it another minute or so while folks join in. Um, Thanks for the compliment, Kylie. All right. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and kick us off a little bit. Um, so for those of you who I don't know, because I know there's a lot of folks out today, my name is Miranda Hitchcock. I'm one of the founders of Every Dog Behavior and Training. We are a nonprofit in Austin, Texas. My dog is sniffing something voraciously. Um, we're a nonprofit in Austin, Texas that is dedicated to making dog training and behavior resources more accessible for folks. So we do a mix of things, including private training and group classes. We offer financial aid on everything we do um, and all kinds of cool stuff in the Austin community. But we also do webinars usually once or twice a month. They're always free, they're always recorded. Um, so this is actually part of a grant funded series of speakers. So it's our Maddie's Fund speaker series that is being grant funded by Maddie's Fund. Um, if you're interested in learning any more about that, I can direct you to the link. It is everydogaustin.org slash speakers. You can learn more about the speakers in this series. Um, we have some really cool upcoming presenters. So in the next couple of months, we're going to have Sarah McLaudry talking about living with multiple dogs. We have Messina Kikasi, who's going to be speaking about all kinds of different stuff from Q&A dog training. Namita Digashetti um, of Positive Culture and San Choi from Rough Roll Academy are all coming up in the next couple of months. So if you're not already signed up for those, definitely sign up. I'll make sure that um, when we send out our email after the webinar that you guys get the links for those. Um, this webinar is being recorded. All of our webinars are always recorded. I will shoot out an email tomorrow as long as YouTube cooperates and I'm able to get this uploaded then. Um, you will be muted and your videos are off, so don't worry. Um, we cannot hear your dogs if they bark, things like that. Um, but we will be here throughout the time. If you have any questions, um, please put them into that Q&A section. That way I will be able to get them to Cassidy at the end of the webinar for the question section. If you have any technical difficulties, anything like that, just let me know through that same area. I will be monitoring it. Um, and we do have captions available. So if you need those captions, um, just go to the closed caption section and turn those on. They are available for folks. Um, if you have any questions as we go, please let me know. Again, I think we'll have some folks probably joining us um, as we go along, but I think that is all of my notes. So we are really excited for today. As I mentioned, we have, um, we have webinars usually once or twice a month. They're almost always on dog training topics. So we talk about everything from leash reactivity to working with puppies to how do we deal with separation anxiety. So this webinar is a little bit different and it's something that we are super excited about. 
Um, we've been following Cassidy for a really long time on Instagram. If you have not been following Ginger's Naps, you should be. Um, and this is a conversation that is really near and dear to our hearts. For us, it is really important that our industry be inclusive and be accepting of all kinds of people. And we know that historically that has not always been the case and that there are a lot of places where we have lots of work to do. So we are really excited to have this conversation and uh, be having it with such a knowledgeable speaker. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Cassidy to get us started. Thanks, Miranda. And thank you, Michelle, and every dog behavior and training for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. We're going to see how talking for an hour goes for me. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Cassidy Jones. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm the content creator behind the account Ginger's Naps on Instagram. Um, I am a fifth year PhD candidate in African American Studies and English at Yale. And I am a dog mom to the world's greatest puppy, Ginger Jones, who is over here having a bully stick while we talk about these very serious topics. <clears throat> um, so this PhD is gonna be my fourth degree in African American studies and English and I've also been a black woman for 26 years now and both of these experiences are really important to what I'm here to talk about with y'all today. Um, I tell you this not to try to convince you that I'm the expert or the final authority on race racism and the animal question because I'm definitely not and I have no interest in being that but I'm telling you because I think you should know that I've dedicated my life to answering some of these questions that I'll be raising today um, and to show my commitment to dismantling white supremacy within the animal wel welfare world and beyond. It's an ongoing journey for me and yours is going to be an ongoing journey too. And then my zodiac stuff, if anybody knows about charts, you know, slide in my DMs. I would love to know myself better. Okay. So I've been asked here today because every dog has taken a liking to some of my content, which is great. Ginger's Naps, which started as a photo album for my new puppy, has grown into a handy resource for folks who care all about animals, um, human and non-human animals alike. I share info about my experience as a first-time dog mom and Ginger's allergy journey, but I also share really carefully crafted posts about the history of racism in dog guardianship in the U.S., how pit bulls and BSL are tied directly to racial segregation, how my experience with pet parenting is affected by my being a black woman and how everything around us, everything descends directly from slavery. And you're gonna be like, surely not everything. And I'm telling you right now, it's everything. Um, and it all comes with these convenient little reading lists and sources and image descriptions and Canva graphics because graphic design is my passion. Um, not really. But at heart and by training, I'm a researcher and an educator. So the new purpose of this account is to give my fellow Black pet parents a place to see themselves reflected in pet Instagram and a place to commune together, laugh together, learn together and support each other. Um, but it also serves to provide a place for anti-racist animal lovers and aspiring anti-racist animal lovers to learn how to identify and call out white supremacy when it pops up in these primarily white animal welfare spaces, um, to see where some of these traditions come from, and to develop a deeper understanding of communities some folks may not interact with much in this, once again, very majority white industry. So here's what we're going to get into today. First, we're gonna go over some definitions so that we can make sure we're on the same page about the language I'll be using throughout the presentation. Then we'll dig into the past so that we can start making connections between some of our current anti-Black policies and their historical predecessors. That's gonna mainly focus on US slavery up through the civil rights movement in the late 20th century. Um, and then we're gonna look at where racism appears in the present day animal welfare movement, touching on issues like BSL, adoption requirements, and the experiences of animal, animal industry employees who are people of the global majority. That's a new term going around. We're kicking POC out, apparently. I didn't call this shot. I'm just following what uh, the discourse says. And so the discourse says, instead of POC, we're PGM now, people of the global majority. I'm trying it out. Tell me how you like it. 
Um, and then we're gonna look forward and think through some strategies for incorporating racism into your animal advocacy. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. So sit back, don't relax because it's about to get uncomfortable. All right, so sino-racial, that's really important. It's like the foundation of my account at this point. And it's a term I came across in the book Afro Dog by Benedict Boisseron. Benedict Boisseron. I'm not good at French, but that was the best I have ever said her name. I'm giving myself a pat on the back for that. So um, sino-racial just means relating to both dogs and race. And it describes the bulk of what we'll be talking about today. And again, a lot of what you're gonna see on my Instagram white supremacy. So when I say white supremacy, I'm not talking about the overt racist acts that pretty much everyone know, knows to denounce, like dressing up in white hoods or blue uniforms and murdering Black people. I'm talking about implicit biases and the sneaky, silent things people do and say that keep that hierarchy in place. Everything from banning certain hairstyles and textbooks from classrooms to colonizing countries in Africa and inventing race to justify the treatment of the people there. That is to say, white supremacy exists in places you don't think to look, even among people with big hearts and lots of compassion for cats and dogs, um, and potentially unconsciously within you. It's good to keep an eye out. Um, so an animal advocate. I assume everyone here already has a good handle on this. Animal advocates believe that non-human animals have a right to, quote, proper housing, management, nutrition, disease prevention and treatment, responsible care, and humane handling, according to the AMBA. And they actively participate in trying to secure those rights and dismantle systems that are at odds with animal welfare. Pretty straightforward. I think we all agree there. And I also think we agree that there's a difference between like a dog lover, a cat lover, and an advocate. To be an advocate, one has to publicly support according to the definition. So it's not just about having an affection for something, it's about showing up for that thing as well. You see where I'm going with this. Animal advocates renegotiate this hierarchy we've set up in the animal kingdom where humans are at the top and everything else just has to bend to our will. They don't have a say. They deserve whatever lousy treatment they get so long as we humans are satisfied and not inconvenienced. Animal advocates question that. They challenge that system. So anti-racism. Anti-racists zoom into that animal kingdom hierarchy even more and first and foremost acknowledge that our society also has its own silent but palpable racial hierarchy at the top of which are white people and beneath whom everyone else has to fight for scraps of rights. Anti-racists then question that hierarchy and then actively work to dismantle it through challenging it at every turn. Anti-racism isn't a black square on Instagram. It's a commitment to moving the needle, publicly supporting and participating in our fight against white supremacy. It requires self-reflection, humility, community, and consistency. And an ally. So I've been renegotiating my relationship with the word ally, even since I picked this title. Um, it can be tricky. We most often use ally to refer to white people who take up the anti-racist cause, but I think the tides are turning on that one in terms of public discourse. I read a quote in a book that I'll come back to later called Anti-Racism in Animal Advocacy. In Animal Advocacy. It's a collection of essays that's really good. Um, and humanitarian Sonia Renee Taylor brilliantly articulates, quote, I don't want an ally because an ally means you came here to help me. How are you helping me solve a problem you caused? Why aren't I helping you solve the problem you caused? Why am I not the ally and you the actor? Why is blackness the responsibility holder and whiteness gets to be the helper?" End quote. As such, I consider myself your ally tonight. I'm planting some seeds, but ultimately it'll be up to you to be on the front lines of the fight. Huh. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground. And we haven't even gotten into the dog of it all yet. How is everybody holding up? Good, this is a webinar, so I, I don't know if you're responding well, but I'm gonna assume good. Okay. So canine companionship is a white privilege. This is an out of context quotation from a book I always talk about. I already brought up Benedict Boisseron. You heard it again, didn't you? Um, her book is called Afro Dog Blackness and the Animal Question. 
And in this passage where this quote is, she's referring to a novel titled Our Nig, which was published in 1859, which makes it one of the first novels published by a Black woman in North America. Um, in the novel, the protagonist, who is a free Black woman, is given a dog by the son of the white family she works for, but when that son leaves, the mother takes the dog away from her. However, when, I think that when we go back in time and when we look more closely at the issues of today, we see that a healthy relationship with dogs has constantly been denied from Black people, and because of that, canine companionship is still treated like a white privilege. Uh, the reason it's important for us to keep anti-racism at the forefront of the animal advocacy movement is because the movement cannot succeed without all hands on deck. We cannot be surprised when shelters and rescues are understaffed, adoptions are slow, untrained, unsocialized, and unleashed dogs are everywhere. Dogs are being underfed and understimulated. Folks aren't up to date on their shots, behind on vet visits. And we can't be surprised because a huge demographic of people is alienated from participating in the animal industry. Why would someone want to volunteer their limited free time in a place where microaggressions want, run rampant? Why would they want to spend money adopting a dog from that place? How can we expect people to know how to lead better lives with their dogs if trainers and vets only set up shop in majority white neighborhoods? Trainers deserve to earn a living wage, absolutely. Um, but it's also a fact that the median, in 2019, the median black household earned 61 cents for every dollar um, the median white household earned. When you have less money to play with, dog training and vet visits seem like less of a priority. And when so few of these trainers and vets look like you, even if you can afford these services, you might not feel as comfortable taking up those spaces. So we need more black folks in the animal services, but we also need to radically transform these services so that black folks feel comfortable entering and staying in these fields. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk slavery. I know. It might sound dramatic, but just about everything I see around me ties back to slavery in some way. And that's partially because of my training, right? So I'm taught to look for the roots of issues that I see in front of me. And I study the 19th century, so it's easy for me to make those connections between the past and the present. However, if you're not taught to look for the root of something, and so I know that's what radical means. The actual definition of radical means to get to the root of something. So if you're not taught to be radical and to look for the root, um, a lot of these present instances of racism can be easy to miss. I'm gonna read you a few examples of the nature of the relationship between enslaved black men and dogs. A note about the language, these people all refer to themselves as slaves, but in the present day, it's important to use people-centered language. So when I refer to them, I'll be calling them enslaved people, enslaved folks, human beings. The word slave refers to property and completely ignores the humanity of these people. But when we say enslaved people, we acknowledge that slavery was a condition placed upon these people and not who they were. Oh, oh. back to this. The bloodhound is regularly trained in the United States and advertisements are to be found in the Southern papers of the union from persons advertising themselves as bloodhound trainers and offering to hunt down slaves at $15 a piece, recommending their hounds as the fleetest in the neighborhood, never known to fail. And then this quote continues, advertisements are from time to time inserted stating that slaves have escaped with iron collars about their necks with bands of iron about their feet, marked with the lash, branded with red hot irons, the initials of their master's names burned into their flesh, and the masters advertise the fact that they're being thus branded with their own signature, thereby proving to the world that however damning it may appear to non-slaveholders, such practices are not regarded discredit discreditable among the slaveholders themselves. Why, I believe, if a man should brand his horse in this country, burn the initials of his name into any cattle, and publish the ferocious deed here, that the united execrations of Christians in Britain would descend upon him, yet in the United States, human beings are thus branded. That's a mouthful. 
So we see here that there's a very early recognition of the hypocrisy of so-called animal lovers decrying any type of harm that comes upon non-human animals, but being silent um, upon witnessing the inhumane treatment of black people. Douglas is describing bloodhounds, which are also known as Negro dogs at the time. And Negro dogs were used by enslavers to track down and punish black folks who escaped enslavement. Many dogs were specifically bred and trained to target, track, and attack black flesh. Frederick Douglass describes how enslaved people were forced to brutally beat these dogs and then run in order to teach dogs to hate the sight of black men, to chase, chase them down. Um, so these cruel practices originated in the West Indies and made their way to the uh, US South by the early 18th century. And that's one way that black folks and dogs were pitted against each other from the very beginning. Douglas shares another way they were pitted against each other also. He says, I speak the simple truth when I say I have often been so pinched with hunger that I have fought with the dog, old Nep, for the smallest crumbs that fell from the kitchen table and have been glad when I won a single crumb in the combat. Many times I have followed with eager step the waiting girl when she went out to shake the tablecloth to get the crumbs and small bones flung out for the cats. Um, I feel like a lot of people have heard of Frederick Douglass. He's a very prominent figure. And eventually he becomes a very respected, one of the most respected black men in history. Um, but he's describing here a really dehumanizing and humiliating situation in which he had to compete for scraps with house pets. Um, that's how lonely he ranked in this fabricated racial hierarchy. And children weren't spared either. The younger children, were fed from a trough that was, yes. The younger children were fed from a trough that was 20 feet in length. All the enslaved children stood back until the master had finished stirring the food. And then at a given signal, they dashed to the trough, the trough, where they began eating with their hands. Some even put their mouths in the trough and ate. There were times when the master's dogs and some of the pigs that ran around the yard all came to the trough to share these meals. Mr. Womble states that they were not permitted to strike any of these animals so as to drive them away. And so they protected their faces from the tongues of the intruders by placing their hands on the sides of their faces as they ate. During the meal, the master walked from one end of the trough to the other to see that all was as it should be. So um, this person, George Womble was enslaved. He got interviewed in the 20th century and he's describing seeing children being fed amongst pigs and dogs in a trough used for farm animals, for livestock. Because again, that's how lowly black people, black children were valued and not considered human. Um, Douglas also shares this example about an enslaver whose top priority was the welfare of his pets. His name was Colonel Lloyd, and he had horses and dogs that were from companionship instead of labor, which is, isn't always common. A lot of people couldn't afford to have animals that weren't working in some way. Um, and he expected one of the people he enslaved named Barney to keep these animals clean and comfortable. More clean and comfortable, in fact, than the people that Colonel Lloyd owned. Barney would be severely punished if the horses, for instance, had dust in their hair. So we can see how, again, from very early on, the idea of animal welfare has come at the expense of Black humanity. It's involved degradation. It's involved anti-Black violence. And we've been set up from the beginning to be at odds. Despite the fact that white supremacy forced dogs and other non-human animals to participate in the degradation and punishment of Black human beings, there are still so many examples of fondness and tenderness between them. Black people have actually loved their animal companions from the very beginning. This is um, an excerpt from the narrative of Charles Ball called 50 Years in Chains. And he said, I had a faithful dog called Truman and this poor animal had been my constant companion for more than four years without ever showing cowardice or infidelity but once. And that was when the panther followed us from the woods. I was accordingly anxious to bring my dog with me but as I knew the success of my undertaking depended on secrecy and silence, I thought it safest to abandon my last friend and engage in my perilous enterprise alone. This passage continues, quote, on the morning of the 9th, I went to work as usual, carrying my dinner with me and worked diligently at grubbing until about one o'clock in the day. 
I now sat down and took my last dinner as the slave of my mistress, dividing the contents of my basket with my dog. After I finished, I tied my dog with a rope to a small tree. I set my gun against it, for I thought I should be better without the gun than with it. Tied my knapsack with my bag of meal on my shoulders, and then turned to take a last farewell of my poor dog that stood by the tree to which he was bound, looking wistfully at me. When I approached him, he licked my hands, and then rising on his hind feet and placing his forepaws on my breast, he uttered a long howl, which thrilled through my heart as if he said, my master, don't leave me behind, end quote. That's a really touching moment. In this narrative that came out pre-emancipation, um, that was January 1st, 1863, this is 1859, enslavement is still at its peak, um, and Charles Ball thinks to include this moment in the story of his life, how he became free. This moment before what, what people would probably consider the climax, which is the actual escape, the journey to freedom. He stops and has this beautiful moment with his pet that he truly cares for. You can tell how genuine their bond is. He's sharing his last meal and enslaved people were not getting a lot, a lot of food. So he sh the fact that he's sharing food is really beautiful. Um, and I think we can all envision the hind legs on the ground, four paws on the chest and the licking of the hands. We can all see that we're familiar with those moments. And so it's important to remember that folks who were enslaved also had those moments too. And then one of my favorite quotes from this time period is this one. The slave loves his dog. They are constant companions. He talks with him by day and hunts with him by night. His dog is the only thing under the sun he can call his own. For the master claims the woman that, he, that is called his wife, his offspring, his hut, his pig, his own body, his very soul, end quote. In this way, dog companionship offers a sliver of dignity and autonomy that was considered basically impossible for Black folks living in this time period, especially those who were enslaved. Those who were enslaved didn't even own their own bodies, but having a dog under their guardianship was a small taste of what it felt like to be in control of something. Um, to have a say in something, to have someone who listened to and honored their word. And that's revolutionary for someone who has no authority in any other context. It's a game changer. There are so many examples of enslaved folks using dogs to hunt, which supplemented the very minimal food that they were given from the people who enslaved them. Hunting could also supplement their income because they could sell the excess meat and skins. Uh, my dissertation is in 19th century African-American poetry, but a lot of the poems I read with dogs in them are about the experience of go going hunting with dogs. And they're written in dialect, so I'm not gonna say them, but the general takeaway is that a successful hunt depends on the humans and the dog's ability to read each other, communicate with each other, often silently. There's a bond there on which both creatures depend. There are also examples of people who use dogs to escape. Some folks chose to bring their dogs with them um, to help them navigate difficult and new terrains and help them sniff out food along the way. As such, being enslaved and having a dog could be seen as its own small rebellion. Unfortunately, white folks were made aware of and threatened by that little bit of freedom. An enslaved person empowered by a morsel of dignity through canine companionship or literacy or anything that might make someone want to challenge their condition was very dangerous for the delicate and nonsensical system of slavery. So during and after enslavement, there were widespread attempt, legislative attempts to restrict Black folks access to dogs. And on this slide here, you can see just a few examples of those efforts. That first one is from 1807 and it says, um, it's about trying to pass a law that makes it so no black people can have dogs. Not only that, but also allowing police to kill dogs that are owned by black people, dogs that are in the company of black people. Um, so we can see there that that is not an animal lover. They would rather let a dog die than be under control of a black person. That's 1807. That's far before emancipation, 1858 is right before emancipation is about to happen. Um, and this person at this farmer's club says, a man should not let his Negroes have dogs, better to give him a sword or a gun. So again, we see that threat there. People are feeling endangered 
by Black folks having access to dogs. And then 1874, this is after emancipation. Slavery has ended. Um, so they can't legally say ban Black people from having dogs anymore. So instead they do things like this. Be it enacted that an annual tax of $1 be and is hereby imposed on every dog kept by a slave to be paid by the owner of such slave and that an annual tax of $2 be and is hereby imposed upon every dog kept by any free Negro or other person of color. So this is um, demonstrating how the only people are, yeah. This is how black people get priced out of dog ownership. We talk about it in the present now, how expensive it, how expensive it is. And given the wealth gap, black people are less likely to be able to afford all those costs. But that starts way in the 19th century, end of the 19th century, by putting taxes just on black people's dogs. And the only white people that have to pay these taxes are the ones who own other black people, who own black people. So think about how race and class are inextricably linked in a country built on racial capitalism and how many of the class barriers there are to participating in the dog world will disp dis mm, disproportionately affect Black folks in the present day. Moving a little bit forward in time, we can see how dogs continue to be weaponized against Black folks in the 20th century, with police dogs being used against folks for uh, fighting for civil rights. Just like during enslavement, white people used trained dogs to communicate where Black people could and could not be. They use them to force or limit spatial movement. They use them to enforce arbitrary boundaries. And they use them to stop Black people from seeking better lives, either through escape or through political advocacy. Police dogs continue to be used as weapons against human bodies and almost exclusively against Black bodies. When the Department of Justice investigated the Ferguson Police Department after the protests um, that came after the murder of Mac Mike Brown, they found that, quote, in every canine bite incident for which racial information is available, the subject was African-American, end quote. That's the Department of Justice confirming that this department pretty much only uses dogs on Black people. And this is in the present. Um, they found a pattern of excessive force, inappropriate use of canines, and obviously racially motivated attacks. I read an article by Tyler Wall recently titled, quote, for the very existence of civilization, end quote, the police dog and racial terror. Wall thoroughly explains um, how canine units came to be in the United States in the 50s and 60s. Police dogs have always been a racial justice issue as well, in an anim as well as an animal rights issue. Dogs under underwent training developed in Nazi Germany, including, quote, agitating, teasing, or harassing the dog by yelling or making aggressive movements, end quote, followed by strict and severe discipline to bring out and control the dog's aggression. Sound familiar? These dogs were then released into underserved neighborhoods to hunt or haunt, as Wall argues, black and brown communities. This means that even if police dogs were originally meant for crowd control or keeping order, they quickly evolved just into weapons aimed directly at people who are not white. Um, quote, tough on crime policies, end quote, uh, supported the use of canine force to keep black people in line on the streets and in their homes. Police departments raved about the efficiency with which dogs could subdue, maim, or kill black people reducing the dogs to tools and the people to targets. A Baltimore canine officer said, quote, the, thing, the dog is the most potent, versatile weapon ever invented. You can't shoot around corners, but dogs can go anywhere you direct them, like guided missiles, end quote. Canine units do not see dogs as living creatures with their own internal needs or motivations. They see them like more obedient and specific guns, tools of war, and that war is against us. Wall explains, quote, the weaponization of the dog, the selection, breeding, training, is contingent on the dog's body being taken over by human agents and institutional forces so as to transform the canine into an obedient, disciplined, working dog, a coercive metamorphosis grasped by the discursive conversion from canine, C-A-N-I-N-E, to K-9, the letter K-9. 
see how the mechanics of white supremacy will strip any and everything down to its ability to uphold white supremacy. The strategies used to enslave black men, to transform them from being obedient disciplined workers are echoed in the strategies used to turn dogs into weapons, which then go on to terrorize black people into further obedience. I saw a clip in the news the other day that, uh, this is a sidebar. I don't know if anyone else has seen it, but there was a car chase. The police were chasing down the suspect um, who stopped the car and got out on foot and then was chased by a canine and mauled the ground, and bitten and not released. Even as officers swarmed around the suspect, obviously that person was in control at that point, but they either didn't instruct the dog to let go or it just didn't want to. Um, and then the comments were really egregious. They, people were cheering, saying, good boy, and that dog just got a really delicious treat. Um, a lot of comments about how satisfied and fulfilling it must be for a dog to eat a Black person. And all I could think about was how these are likely the same people that will tell you that slavery is over, even though they sound just like their ancestors. Um, feeding black, black flesh to Negro dogs was a documented approach. They were instructed to eat black people. And that's part of how they were trained to target black people. That's not an outrageous story that actually happened. So these comments talking about how delicious this black person must be sound just like what I read in the archives. Um, yeah, these events are overlapping and inseparable. Police dogs and anti-black violence go hand in hand. Wall wrote that quote, patrol dogs exemplify Gregor Shalmayu's argument that at its core, policing is a hunting institution, end quote. And it always has been. So hopefully at this point, you can see how policies that were developed during enslavement have morphed into things that we see today. That's just the thing about racist institutions. They don't really go away. They just change names, change faces, change shape. And so you have to be really vigilant about looking for white supremacist roots all around you. Yeah. The main places where I see white supremacy and anti-Blackness pop up in the animal advocacy world today is through the lack of diversity in these spaces and especially in leadership and um, through anti-pit rhetoric and breed specific legislation. But I wanna pause to note this gorgeous picture from the Tuskegee Veterinary School. Tuskegee, this one school I believe is responsible for 86% of Black people who become veterinarians in this one place. So obviously they're not gonna be as many if everyone has to get trained in the same place. Um, lack of diversity makes it so much harder for black folks who do love animals and want to get involved with rescue and advocacy to break into the field, either because the doors are closed in their faces or because once they get there, they find it so inhospitable they couldn't possibly continue there unscathed. So the first problem, lack of diversity. It's hard to get the exact numbers on these things, but Zipia estimates that in 2020, only 3.2% of dog trainers were black. In 2019, the US, US Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that 0% of employed veterinarians were black, likely because the figure was so low, it couldn't even be rounded up to one. Um, when you think about dog sport events or shows, how many black people do you remember in the audience, let alone participating? Even at home, at your local dog, dog park, are there Black folks there? Do you speak to them? I had the chance to interview the lovely Dr. Hodges, who is one of two veterinary stars on the show, Critter Fixers. Be sure to watch that. Um, and he said, if you don't see Black veterinarians, then how can you ever want to be one? Of course, it's possible to strive for things that have never been done before, but that's asking so much more of Black youth than white youth who get to see themselves reflected in every profession. Being the first anything is such a huge emotional hurdle and it requires grit and perseverance on top of all the studying and educational things. Then once someone is the first, they have to do the additional labor of either bearing all the ignorant things that their peers will inevitably say to them or educating those people. More unpaid labor, more time spent away from doing the job they were hired to do 
or participating in the sports they came to participate in or enriching the dog by walking them through the neighborhood, really anything. Being the only one responsible for anti-racism in a space is a huge distraction from the work that Black folks came to do. Despite being underrepresented in just about everything else having to do with animals, when it comes to dog fighting arrests and other dog related infractions, Black people are unsurprisingly overrepresented. In his article, Race, Mass, Criminalization, and Animal Law Beyond Cages, Justin Marzal reports that, quote, in the year after Michael Vick's conviction, Black Americans experienced a 19% increase in dog fighting arrests while other racial groups saw no such increase, end quote. Which sounds more likely to you? In that year, 19% more African-Americans saw dog fighting as a viable source of income, or in that year, police paid extra attention to black people and no one else leading to a jump in arrests in this specific group. Now I am by no means making excuses for anyone who abuses animals. I'm simply asking you to think about who gets punished the most for these crimes and why that might be the case. Additionally, what are the effects of creating this association in America's mind between black people and animal abuse? If everyone you see getting the book thrown at them for animal abuse is black, how might that affect your decisions and behaviors as someone responsible for rescuing and adopting out dogs? You'd probably hesitate a little bit more once you saw a black applicant. That's seems likely to me. If we create this association, it's going to have real life repercussions. Mass incarceration then should also be an animal advocacy issue because who are you going to adopt dogs to when everyone's behind bars? Did you know that 67% of people in jails right now have not yet been convicted of a crime? They are still awaiting trial. And since we've already covered the wealth gap in the U.S., you know who's more likely to make bail and who's more likely to have to sit and wait. Since black folks are the most likely to get arrested, what does that mean for black pet parents? What happens to someone's dog when they get arrested and have to wait for trial? Those dogs either have to be rehomed or sent back to the shelter. And what are animal advocates who wanna keep dogs in their homes going to do about unfair policing and sentencing? These are the conversations I think we should be having. We also need to make sure adoption requirements are fair. Again, in a place where class is inseparable from race, when you make adoption requirements that are extremely classed, like needing a fence or a certain income threshold or an occupational field or a certain zip code or references and established relationships with veterinarians who don't exist in your neighborhood or who aren't black or harbor some of the same implicit biases, where does that leave future black adopters? It leaves them with limited options. We're making progress as I see more and more rescues use updated language and getting rid of some of the more arbitrary requirements, but there's still a lot of work to do. One of the shelters in my area, for example, you have to pay to fill out the application. You can't even look at the application without putting in your credit card information. Another one requires you to send in a receipt for a six week obedience class before you can adopt any animal from there. These prices add up and animal companionship gets more and more exclusive and gets more and more, it becomes more and more of a white privilege. The process of adoption can be very subjective. And I know most rescues are underfunded and understaffed. So folks don't have a lot of time to spend on each dog and each applicant. That means a lot of snap decisions and gut instincts are made and used to um, force these quick turnarounds. But if everyone making those decisions is white and none of them have committed to anti-racism or even interrogated their own whiteness, those decisions are gonna be full of implicit biases that make the process 10 times harder for black adopters. Things are also more difficult for black employees in the animal industry. Not only do they have to listen to prejudiced comments about people outside of the shelter, they also have to deal with the microaggressions directed toward themselves. You can read some of these firsthand accounts in that book I mentioned, Anti-Racism and Animal Advocacy, but you can also just listen to people living it in real time. One of my favorites is um, Nina Love at the Black Thornberry on Instagram. She has her own rescue. She's a Black woman. She's killing it. But she also talks about how tiring it is to be a Black woman in this industry. Um, Companions and Animals for Reform and Equity, or CARE, that's how, what they go by, published a report called Underrepresentation in African-American Employees and Animal Welfare. 
In it, they throw out some of the possible reasons for the lack of Black folks working in animal welfare, including economic disparities, disparities between African Americans and white folks. Um, we can see how that happens, right? If you already have a really high paying job, it might make sense for you to take a couple hours to volunteer. Um, if your family is moneyed, then you don't need that high paying of a job. I don't think many people go into animal rescue to get rich. So um, it's more accommodating for people who already have money to back them up. And we know who has most of the wealth in this country. Other reasons, um, ongoing civil rights struggles, a moral obligation to serve people and communities before animals, inadequate career exposure and recruitment, non-supportive environments once hired, and prejudice and discrimination. There are stories all over the internet about Black volunteers being mistaken for str strangers or intruders, being mistrusted by leadership and coworkers, and being burnt out from doing all of the DEI work for no compensation. That's a problem we see a lot, right? People will bring in this diversity person who is supposed to, I guess, erase or address all of the racism in a company by themselves, even though it is isn't definitely not a one-man job. Um, so obviously folks get burnt out from that. And most of the time they weren't even hired for that. They were just black and got hired for some animal stuff and then got roped into doing a whole bunch of extra work. So we need more black people to get involved and stay involved in the animal welfare industry. But the way to accomplish that isn't by trying to guilt us into it or appeal to some sort of morality on our end. It's by making the animal welfare community more hospitable for black folks. It's about educating yourself so that black employees and volunteers don't have to add that work to their job description. It's about tracking your own biases. And most importantly, it's about outreach, but we'll touch more on that later. The racial burden of animal rescue isn't just on people either. A study recently came out that showed that animals with black sounding names are less likely to get adopted. I just think that this table from this like peer reviewed research article is hilarious. They're trying to, this table is showing how associated a name is with a particular race. Like when folks see Ben, there's almost a hundred percent chance they're gonna think it's a white person. That's what that scale means. Um, so that study, it's titled, When a Name Gives You Pause, Racialized Names and, the, and Time to Adoption in the County Dog Shelter by Natasha Quadlin and Bradlin Montgomery. And they found that, quote, as dogs' names are increasingly perceived as white, people adopt them faster. Conversely, as dogs' names are increasingly perceived as non-human, like Fluffy all the way over there on the right, um, people adopt them slower. Surprising. That surprised me. Perceptions of Black names are likewise tied to slower times to adoption, with this effect being concentrated among pit bulls. So they found there wasn't really as much of a difference um, when breed was not a factor, but for pit bulls, it made all the difference. So now we have empirical proof that not only are we human beings be affected, being affected by anti-Blackness, but pets are also being affected by anti-Blackness. White supremacy is so pervasive so ingrained in our culture that if a dog has a name that triggers an association with Black people, adopters will pass him up. That's horrific to me. That's really sad. And then the last place where I see racism coming up in discourse or racism expressed um, in the dog world is discussions about pit bulls and breed specific legislation. This is a topic I get asked about a lot. It's also a topic people feel very passionate about on both sides of the spectrum. I'm partial to Harlan Weaver's breakdown of this timeline. So I'm gonna be drawing a lot of this um, from his work. And he just put out a book called Bad Dog, Pitbull Politics and Multi-Species Justice that I highly recommend. But this is also gonna come from a popular book by Brown and Dickey called Pitbull's Battle for an American Icon. A lot more folks are familiar with that one. Bad dog is very new. So first things first, pit bulls started out as a white thing. They were a breed associated with whiteness, white families, white men were the ones breeding them. White men were 
white men were the ones fighting them. Um, a whole white American, white American patriotic thing. And pit bulls, I'm saying that with quotes around it because the term has lost really any sort of meaning. I'd actually never had one, um, but we're really terrible at identifying them. And yeah, there's barely any meaning associated with it to begin with. Pit bulls were bred by a notorious white dog fighter named John P. Colby, who lived in Massachusetts, who wanted to maximize his profits by keeping his fighting dogs, but also selling a family dog, which were, those dogs were eventually renamed the American Pit Bull Terriers, which was a whole marketing gimmick. This is the 1880s that we're talking about. Because it's a marketing gimmick because they weren't really American. They came from English and Irish dogs um, and they never hunted vermin. So they weren't really terriers. Again, pit bulls, had, it had, really has no meaning. All the while though, dog fighters at the time are primarily white Southern men. Back to pit bulls, beloved family dog, very American dog, comprised of like a dozen different breeds, even at its inception, um, because everything looks like a pit bull, even back then. And then World War I happens and pit bulls can be seen everywhere representing military valor, representing America, like you can see in this poster from 1915. Um, there are pictures of bulldog mascots in the trenches with British shoulder, soldiers in active war. And World War II is much of the same. The same thing is happening. These are still a very American dog. Um, and so for the most part, people are very happy with their pit bulls. It's true that there was a time in the U.S. when people left their children home alone with pets. That was a phenomenon, but it wasn't just pit bulls. And no one used the phrase nanny dog to refer to pit bulls until the 1970s. It traces back to this one person in the 1970s and just kind of blew up as this myth that is also pervasive. And I've talked about on my page before how it's really important not to fight the anti-pit myths with pro-pit myths. I just think it's important for people to look at the dog in front of them and analyze that dog. Um, yeah, in the latter half of the 20th century, however, pit bulls started becoming a black dog. This is like around 60s, 70s, 80s. Redlining and poverty created really unsafe neighborhoods that were really racially segregated and black folks who couldn't afford to live anywhere else started getting pit bulls to protect themselves in their homes. Black and brown men involved in criminal activity also had dogs for much of the same reason and because breeding and fighting brings in even more income, which again is a response to the conditions poverty created. And again, I'm not excusing this behavior. Animal abuse is animal abuse is wrong. As dog lovers, though, we know that in order to address a behavior, we have to think critically about what triggers that behavior and what conditions lead to that behavior. And in this case, it's poverty and racial segregation. Anyways, we're in the 1980s now and more black and brown men are entering the breeding game. Pit bulls are being seen increasingly as less of a white middle-class family dog and more of a poor black dog. As politicians wage wars on um, the wars on drugs, wars on crime, pit bulls get swept up in the imagery and suddenly they're criminalized as well. Unsurprisingly, this is when a huge wave of pushes for breed specific legislation comes up. Pit bulls were portrayed as more dangerous than ever. And this is specifically because of their new proximity to blackness which has always been America's biggest imagined threat. Weaver marks a pivotal moment in Pitbull history as the conviction of Mike Vick in 2007. Vick's charges flipped a switch in the American mind and Pitbulls went from criminals themselves to victims. Those dogs were put through a reform program basically and they were retrained and rehomed and their image was totally reversed and that was through a proximity to whiteness. White animal advocates came forward and made these dogs their personal projects. And this turn toward rescuing pit bulls divorced the dogs from their black racialized context and aligned them once again with the white middle-class family values, thus making them worthy, adoptable, lovable, safe. We see it in a lot of the imagery that goes around, um, imagery that's not on dogbites.org. We see a lot of pit bulls being like infantilized to make them seem safer. And I'm trying to 
articulate that this imagery is specifically to make them seem like white family dogs and not black family dogs any longer. The safety comes in there being more aligned with pictures of white folks than pictures of black folks. Alan Weaver also has a super important point in his chapter, uh, Becoming in Kind, Race, Gender, Class, and Nation in Cultures of Dog Rescue and Dog Fighting. I think it's one of the most important reads in the animal world, um, in my opinion. And the big point is that our proximity to animals informs our identity and the animal's identity. So, oh, that bully sick tired Ginger out. So how she's viewed on her own is different from how Ginger is viewed when she's standing beside me. And that's different from how she would be viewed standing beside a white woman. I'll let that sink in for a little bit. When Ginger is on her own, she has vaguely pit features. A lot of people identify her as a pit, pit bull. I've never had her tested, couldn't tell you. Um, but some people might think, Oh, she's a pity, she's adorable, she probably wears tutus and pajamas, and some people might think she is a killer. A lot of people think she is a killer. Um, and then when she's standing beside me, that increases. Standing beside a Black person, she becomes even more of a danger, more of a threat, and so do I. Um, and then if she were to stand beside a white woman, she'd be a lovable rescue dog again, totally safe, totally nullified, um, in good hands. That's how her image would change. And then for me, um, her presence changes how I'm viewed. And that view is different from how I'd be viewed standing next to a Corgi or a Golden Retriever. Retriever. Standing next to a pit-like dog, I could be considered more dangerous, but I, if I stand next to something small and cute, um, then I'm less of a threat. Racism, sexism, and classism change how we as humans are read, and those conditions also change how our dogs are read, like we saw with that study about the names earlier. People who hate pit bulls will spew statistics and falsified facts about how pit bulls are the most dangerous in the world and how they bite more and kill more than any other dog in the world, and they shouldn't be allowed to live in certain places, and really they shouldn't be allowed to live, period. That seems to be the main argument to me. Let me tell you, this is all bad science. I did the reading. I went on the websites. I clicked the links. Most of the links went back to the same website. They were citing themselves. It's like saying, what's your source? And someone going, dude, just trust me. That's not science to me. Um, bite reports are notoriously unreliable. And study after study has been conducted to show just how terrible we are at identifying pit bulls by sight. Also, as an umbrella term, of course the data will be skewed. We're bunching a bunch of different kinds of dogs together. Um, that's gonna affect the numbers. And <clears throat> additionally, the way to curb dog bites is to educate about animal behavior, not to euthanize every blockheaded dog at sight. Bites are very rarely the first sign of a dog's aggression. Are we familiar with the latter of aggression? You know how there's the green zone things like looking away or licking lips and the orange zone things, and, and those are a little bit more dangerous, creating space, and then you get up to growling, snapping, and biting at the top, which are the red zone things. But um, it's so rare for a dog to jump right to the top of that ladder. But when people don't know to look for those green and yellow and orange signs, bites appear to happen just out of the blue. I'm sure everyone here knows that these myths about a special bite force or a locking jaw is a that's all a bunch of baloney so you know here's some baloney i'm just making sure we agree this is not real this is not science um so now the pitbull haters are proposing this is ginger's bestie leo isn't he cute yeah i love them together anyways so now the pit bull haters are proposing breed specific legislation everywhere and there are lots of dog breeds on those lists, but for some reason pitties are the ones most likely to get called out. I know that a lot of these rules have to do with insurance and most insurance companies won't cover a building or a business that permits pit bulls and other dangerous breeds. 
But citywide ordinances are making this choice, not based on data or insurance policies, it's based on human bias. Follow along with me. If we know that more and more people associate pit bulls with black and brown communities when this wave of breed specific legislation first starts in the 80s, uh, what can we assume about the demographics of the neighborhoods where BSL was enforced? It's going to get the black people right up out of there. They can't stay there with those dogs. Or it gets the dogs up out of there. And I don't know. It's mostly going to be looked for in these poor black communities because that's who we actually want to police. Um, and then since we know racist apples don't fall from their racist trees, we can be pretty confident that even today, BSL disproportionately affects low-income people of the global majority whose housing options are already limited by wealth inequality. So if you can only have a pit bull by owning a house in a specific neighborhood, but redlining and racial housing discrimination prevents Black folks from picking up and moving somewhere or owning property altogether, pit bulls become a white privilege by default. By the way, it's really important for me to mention that I am never saying that black people equal pit bulls. I would never make the argument that BSL is exactly the same of racism or even a form of racism. I'm saying that anti pit bull legislation and rhetoric and anti blackness are heavily intertwined, they're connected. Um, again, intertwined, heavily related, not the same thing. No need to dehumanize Black folks any further by equating our struggle to that of dogs. In an article titled, quote, Taking the Ghetto Out of the Dog, Reproducing Inequality and Pit Bull Rescue, unquote, Katya Gunther asks the really provocative question, quote, what would an anti-racist, anti-sexist, and anti-classist approach to working with pit bulls look like, end quote. And her answer is equally profound. And this is basically the entire final chapter of this article, but I think it's really important to hear. So she says, <clears throat> it would start by examining how animal practices operate as a form of racialized violence and would empirically question beliefs that some ways of keeping animal companions are superior to, other words, more humane, end quote, than others. On a practical level, it would engage more deeply with the communities from which these dogs come and ideally be led by those communities. As a starting point, rather than rescuing dogs after they come into the shelter, pit bull advocates could address the structural, structural conditions that lead to dogs coming into shelters. Those things are housing discrimination, economic precarity, over-policing, also by animal control agents and unjust animal control policies and practices, among others. Some organizations in Los Angeles provide free or low-cost sterilization surgery, surgery and free dog food programs, but generally on a small scale and with short-term projects that have little, if any, orientation towards alleviating the underlying inequalities that place human and non-human animals in poverty. Distributing dog food or vaccines to unhoused people for their companion animals, for instance, reduces their suffering and that of their companion animals, but does not challenge the constructed binary between the deserving and undeserving poor, nor does it change the structures that contribute to homelessness or to why unhoused people with companion animals have an extra burden when trying to find housing. Linking animal rights, whether for companion animals or other types of animals, to a broader agenda for racial, economic, and gender justice requires a more concerted effort that would incorporate pushing for more affordable housing and more of it that welcomes pit bulls, as well as challenging purportedly colorblind breed discrimination policies that disproportionately impact Black and Latinx people and their dogs." End quote. A lot to take in. Um, and rereading that, I just remembered that animal control example, I had an issue recently where I tried to save a turtle. I was on my way to lunch. There's a turtle in the middle of the road. Um, I looked up the animal control number for that town. They directed me to the police and that put me in a really precarious position. I had to decide if saving this turtle was worth having a, a potentially really bad police interaction when the, I, I mean, I. Of 
course called for the turtle and the self-referred turtle. But when the police arrived, I thought he'd been informed that I was standing there waiting for the turtle. I had put my blinkers on and stopped in front of the turtle so people wouldn't hit it. It was dead in the middle of the lane. Um, and he told me to get back in my car because he thought I was committing a traffic violation. I thought we were working together to save a turtle. He saw a black person breaking the rules. So that could have gone really poorly for me. And that is another barrier for black folks who want to get involved with rescue. Why are cops involved in the first place? Okay. So we made it to the future section. Everybody take a deep breath. Kudos to you for hanging in there. Kudos to me for saying more words consecutively in the last hour than I've said in the entire duration of the pandemic. Whew. The bulk of my conversations for the last few years have been uh, going back and forth with Instacart deliverers about which dairy-free milk I need. So this is a lot for me, but I'm excited about it. Okay. Um, this is the part people are probably anticipating the most. I think whenever there's a conversation about racism and anti-racism, everybody just wants to know, what can I do? What should I do? So we're gonna go get into some do's and don'ts real quick. Now I'm an English major, so language is very important to me. Um, that's where we're gonna start. First and foremost, golden rule, absolutely nothing equals slavery. Nothing is slavery. Nothing is just like slavery, nothing. Don't even bother. Don't do that. You can talk about how things are connected to slavery. You can talk about how practices that originated in slavery are now showing up again in these, in this anti-animal violence, but never ever say that they're equal, please. Firstly, because it's very obviously not the same, excluding human beings from humanity and human rights and excluding non-human animals from humanity and human rights are actually quite different. Even if we agree that those animals do deserve better, and secondly, it implies that America is past slavery, which we're very much not. Black people and everyone else for that matter uh, are still living with the consequences of slavery. It shows up in our culture, it shows up in our economy, it shows up in everything. We just spent an hour talking about how it shows up in the pet industry. So saying anything that suggests that animals are the new slaves or whatever BS PW talk about, is just a bad way to try to pull Black folks into the movement. Don't do that. Similarly, Blank Lives Matter, punchy slogans, I cannot stand those. I've seen like Pitbull's Lives Matter and stuff like that. It's literally erasing Black people from their own movement. Be original, be creative, and do not just ride on the coattails of Black activists and think you can just co-opt our language for your own causes. That's not a good practice. Additionally, stop saying things like, I don't see color, let's keep this just about the dogs, not everything is about race, and this one is a hot take. I just like dogs more than people. I know a lot of people say that, to be quirky and fun, but I don't think it's quirky and fun. Colorblind racism is a thing. Not seeing color means that you're not seeing important patterns that affect my quality of life. I'm definitely more than my skin color, but if you say you don't see color, I don't think you can see me very well. And so I don't trust you. Let's keep this about the dogs and not everything is about race are pretty similar in impact for me. We live in a society where literally nothing can be divorced from race. If you're not thinking about race, it's likely because your life has never depended on your thinking about race. You've never had to be aware that you have a race, but you do have one. And it informs just about everything you experience. Being able to escape the burden of racism is a privilege. I've said it before, but even these pet pages have political stakes and implications. I'm black when I'm on the internet and when I'm not. I'm black when I take videos of Ginger and I'm black when I write our captions. I'm black when I'm liking your pictures and replying to your stories. I'm black all the time. And I love being black and I love being Ginger's mom. And I cannot emphasize enough that I am both of these things at the same time, all the time. Not everything I post on my dog's Instagram is overtly political or sino racial, but everything I post makes a statement. When I make the choice to post something funny, um, I've simultaneously made the choice not to address all of the terrible things that are going on in the world at the moment, because it's impossible for me and you to know everything, and it's not sustainable to try to raise awareness about everything at once, because we're human beings and we can only do so much. And we deserve levity and the joy that dogs bring into our lives in the pet community on Instagram. 
but I am still committed to my freedom and yours. The best way to help pets is to help people. We have to take care of each other as well as we're taking care of the animals. And that ties into why saying I just like dogs more than people makes me not trust you again. Colonel Lord probably said the same thing as he berated Barney for messing up Seabiscuit's bangs. I just don't find it quirky or funny. It could just be me. That could be a personal preference. Um, but when I hear you say I just like dogs more than people, all I hear is I don't give a hoot if you live or die. That's what I hear. That could be just me though. That's okay. And then this one is uh, a little bit more nitpicky, but Blacks is out. We don't refer to groups of people as Blacks. We are Black people. So remember people-centered language, like not slaves and slave people, not Blacks, Black people. Okay, actions to take. We've covered what we should and shouldn't be saying, but advocates and anti-racists are doers. So what should we do? Firstly, be very intentional about offering opportunities and roles, especially leadership roles to black folks and other people of the global majority. And then pay them to be in those roles and then support them once they get there, listen to them. Secondly, be intentional about outreach, provide resources, trainings, and educations about animal welfare to underserved communities. Every dog seems to be doing that, that's lovely. Literally go there, go out into these communities. You know where the neighborhoods are. It's everywhere beyond the street. Your boss warned you not to pass. Do research and try to identify which leaders are already there doing the work. I have a link in my Instagram bio that'll take you to two different directories. There's one that's just for black people. There's one for people of the global majority more broadly, um, where you can find people who love animals and sometimes they include their location. So you can find someone local, someone who loves animals, someone who isn't white and someone who's probably really eager to collaborate with someone with your or your institution's resources and platforms. So go find them, follow them. If they have social media accounts, link up, invite them to speak on their experiences and pay them. That's really important. Thirdly, be intentional about buying from black pet businesses. You can find just about anything you are already gonna buy for your pet from a black creative or reseller. There are plenty of businesses in those directories I mentioned, again, in the link in my bio. Fourthly, be intentional about welcoming Black folks into pet spaces you already inhabit. So talk to the people who come to dog parks, dog shows, dog sports, other events. Think about it. If there's a sport that has a history that identifies you more with the hunted than the hunter or the tracked rather than the tracker, you may be a little bit nervous about getting involved. So be social, help people ease into it. Number five is about being intentional about what you choose to participate in online. This one can be tricky. There are certain trends that go around that to me are very obviously racially coded. Um, trends where blackness is the actual joke. Trends with the N word in the lyrics that you could go find the clean version for, but you wanna use the trending audio for the boost in views, no matter who you offend. Trends that are very obviously black voices that make you shake your head and start doing all this that you don't actually do. So just be mindful. And if you have a funny feeling about something, probably don't do it. Number six is about being less defensive. I assume you all came here because you wanted to learn something, but there will be times out there in the future when you have a teachable moment and you may get called out for a mistake. Do your best to take in what is being said and learn the lesson, even though it stings. I know it's really uncomfortable and I'm proud of you all for being here right now, but you're not gonna get canceled for messing up. I will, however, look at you differently if you mess up, get called out and then double down or reflect. Genuine apologies go a really long way. Number seven, show concern about black issues even when they're not animal related and even when it's not popular online. That one is self-explanatory. Number eight, do not ask black people for any more free labor. And when we are doing free labor, please be mindful that we may not have the energy to do more free labor that day. I absolutely love that people feel comfortable asking me difficult questions as they confront their privilege. And as a teacher, creating an environment that feels safe to learn is my top priority, but sometimes I don't have it in me at the long, end of a long day to read a four paragraph message about the day you learned you were white. And I love you, but I can't always do it. I'll usually come back and reply though at some point, just give me a second on that one. Um, I do the work that I do because I love to do it, but now that the page is growing and more opportunities are opening up, opening up, it also makes a big difference when people share my posts 
and when they engage with my content, especially sponsored content. That's a way to help Black folks get paid without you having to take money out of your own pocket. When you see a Black pet influencer or any kind of influencer put up a paid partnership post, be sure to like that one and comment it and save it and share it and DM it to your homeboys because those actions really go a long way and make it possible for people like me to keep doing this work for you. Number nine, do your best to educate yourself. The reason I have sources and reading lists attached to my posts is because I want you to be able to go find the answer to any questions that might pop up while you're reading the post. If you need somewhere to start, I do have a readings highlight on my Instagram um, and I just made a post with my reading suggestions. So head on over to Ginger's Naps and get cracking. And lastly, interrogate yourself. When a judgmental thought pops into your head, question where it comes from. When a negative association enters your mind, try to get back to the roots. Some questions you might ask yourself are, what assumptions have I made about this person and what context created that assumption? What can I do to make this person feel safer in my presence, in my community, in my workplace, et cetera? Is there any historical legacy for this decision I've just made? And is it a legacy that I'm proud of? And before I assume the worst, is there any other explanation for why this person might not be doing the best with their pet? What systems have failed them? What resources would have helped them? And how can I redistribute those sources? All right, I did it. <laughs> you did it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Y'all are troopers. I've been talking for over an hour. And your reward is that I'm going to keep talking. Yay. You did it. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I that was a lot of information, it was. even, even beyond just the amount of time. That's a lot of information to try and pack in. Um, folks, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in that Q and a section. Um, and I will answer, uh, I will get to some of these things and make sure that I get you the answers for those. Um, Kelly asked, can we get a reading list from things referenced in the presentation? Uh, Absolutely. Yep. So Cassie already told me that she's going to send us a whole bunch of fun stuff uh, to go out with the webinar recording. So um, I believe it's slides and transcripts, things like that. Perfect. But you can all, always find readings on my Instagram. Yep. And there's nothing in this presentation that I talked about that was new. I've talked about it all on my Instagram before. So cool. Um, okay, someone asked earlier about the the name K9 and how that was kind of changed to the K-9 mm -hmm. um, and what that meant. Could you cover that again and, and why that's problematic? Yeah, it's not problematic. It was just Tyler Wall making an example of how um, the how weaponizing these dogs literally transforms them. So I I don't think I can type here but the C-A-N-I-N-E, a canine is still a dog. But when you get to a canine, like K-9, a canine unit, that thing is no longer looked at like a dog. It's looked at like a weapon. So Tyler Wall is just making that distinction, that transition from being a dog, a living creature to being a thing that is used as a tool for white supremacy. Awesome. Uh, how do you see anti-racist animal advocacy on a global sense beyond the U.S.? I feel that what you're saying is very important to understand dog relations between global North and South. I don't think I'm really qualified to answer that for real. Most of my research, research is U.S. based, um, but there are people to follow everywhere. I know I'm not the only one having these conversations, so it's just going to take a bit of research to finding out where those experts are. There was a really cool uh, conference just, I think last week or the week before the canine conference in color with the British oh, spelling yeah. with the U in it, um, run by some really cool folks talking about dog training, but also talking about some of this. So you might find some good resources there too. Um, I know this webinar is dog oriented, but do you have any thoughts on cat oriented racism issues? No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I've never had a cat. Um, I've never, I would assume that the race, that the issues are somewhat similar. They're not cat units um, or cats being used against people really, but the adoption requirements, uh, those hurdles can still be the same. Not being able to access vets, um, costs accruing and excluding people, that kind of thing. The cat units would be. I don't know about cat units, yeah. We should, uh, I'll try and talk to, uh, what's her name from the Black Thornberries? 
Nina Love. Nina, I'll have to, I'll have to reach out to her. Maybe she can tell us some more about what that looks like on the cat side. And then there's like eccentric kitties, eccentric oh. kitties in New York who's black and rescues cats, does trap neuter release for cats. And then also who you call in bully also advocates for trap neuter release for cats. Awesome. Um, I love this question. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, can we have your cash app or Venmo to show our appreciation for this extremely comprehensive and important presentation? <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, my cash app and Venmo are always in the link in my bio on Instagram. But um, for cash app, it's dollar sign CAS app. It's C A S S A P P. I thought I was being cute back when I made this like high school. And then my Venmo is just at Cassidy Dash Jones. Perfect. And I will, um, Cassie, if you'll send me those, I'll make sure that those go out in the email too. Very cool. Thanks. Um, let's see. How do you safely respond to microaggressions in the dog pet industry? First, I assess if I have the energy to do that, there's a chance I don't have it in me today and I'm just going to walk away. Um, secondly, a lot of the microaggressions that we see in the pet industry are usually the same ones over and over again. At this point, I have a spiel for just about everything. Um, I would say if you're trying to get started addressing microaggressions, the thing you need to do is read, learn why it's a microaggression so you can very quickly and easily articulate that to someone else. Um, Cause normally in those moments, it, you gotta be quick with it. Cause folks say something that they didn't even register as a significant thing and they're gonna move on. So you wanna be able to attack on that teachable moment. Yep. And one other resource for cat folks, uh, Trap King. I yeah. totally forgot about Trap King. Yeah, um, check him out. Very, very cool stuff. Um, Another question, I live in New York State and often wonder about the hidden repercussions of the recent trend to ship select shelter dogs to the Northeast. Have you come across any research on the racist effects this has, especially on communities in the Southern US? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry, can you say it again? <laughs> yeah, so living in New York, there are often dogs who are shipped up from like the Southern US, like from Texas up to the North. Um, uh -huh. And some of their they tend to be select dogs that are being sent up north, like the highly desirables, okay. the puppies, the easier dogs right. um, tend to be the ones getting sent up and what kind of implications that might have, um, especially on communities already living in the Southern US. Yeah, it seems like that gives you a little bit of an insight into who people think that the audience for adoption is. If we're sending up these highly adoptable, usually pretty expensive and exclusive breeds, we it seems like we know who we want them to go to, who's going to be able to afford to take them on. Um, as far as communities in the South, are we thinking that perhaps the dogs that are left there are a very specific type and that furthers the association between Southern folks, the densest population of Black folks in the United States is in the South. So. Um, are we thinking that there might be a connection between the dogs that get left behind and the people that are only able to adopt those? Because I could see that, but I haven't done any specific research on it yet. Yeah, there's a lot of really interesting stuff there. There's a lot of really interesting stuff about dogs being brought over, um, for example, from Asia or from islands from different parts of the world into the United States. Um, for example, like street dogs or streeties coming from other places and the ethics and the the racial components of that is really interesting as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any speaking points, advice, or specific resources to provide my local rescue that has classist requirements, like a six foot fenced yard to get them to change this? I wanna reach out to them, but don't wanna get blown off. Yes, Stephanie, Tembo and Leica on Instagram has an actual template. I'm going to ask her for it so I can share it tomorrow, something shared on my story, but yeah, you don't even have to think of the words. It's already been thought for you. Boom. Yep. Awesome. And if you don't have it already, the adopters welcome uh, whole info packet is great on that. Best Friends has some uh, like open adoption resources as well. If you're looking for somebody from the shelter community who can throw you stuff there too. Um, let's see. Oh gosh. Sorry, managing, managing the questions. Um, any advice specifically for veterinarians toward fostering a more anti-racist inclusive practice? Yeah, I think there are things you could do to make your office a more comfortable space. I think that involves familiarizing yourself with the issues um, and being able to 
get out in front of those without the, the non-white person in front of you having to do that work for you. So if you automatic, automatically talk about how an issue is a class issue, that's something that would make me trust you a little bit more. Um, if you talk about how whatever issue we're facing is, has to do with race or um, how the Black community has kind of been pushed out of good animal health care through pricing and racism, that's something that would make you trust you make me trust you more. I think it all goes back to just doing your research and getting out in front of it. Awesome. Uh, a great quick comment on here that reservation dogs from tribal lands or res dogs are often included in dogs being shipped elsewhere. So hmm. in addition to dogs coming from other places to the US, we also have these dogs also. Um, somebody asked, where do you see the intersection of uh, GMP and disabilities intersect? For example, getting a service animal is hard enough if you are white or white passing. Yeah, I think you already know what I'm going to say there. It's nearly impossible. One, for non-white people to be able to afford those services that are very expensive and then to do all the other qualifications on top of that. Um, that's another area that can be kind of subject. Uh, what is the word I'm trying, I'm thinking of? I don't remember what that word is, but that's another field where uh, someone's personal opinion of you can have a big effect on the outcome of whatever process you're trying to get through. Um, and so if those folks aren't committed to being anti-racist, a lot of people are just going to get completely booted out of the process um, before they even have a chance to start. People awesome. like to think of disability and race as very separate, but there's a very large community of Black disabled people who can't even get diagnoses sometimes because of medical racism. So it all just compounds, yeah. We also have a lot of questions on here that are not questions, they're just thank yous. Um, oh, so yeah. I just wanted to echo that. I think we have, I'm gonna give it another minute in case people wanna put in their last minute questions here, but I really, really appreciate you coming on board. Again, this is a subject that you have so much knowledge on as evidenced by the many thousands of words that you have so prepared for us today. Um, <laughs> just so folks know if they're looking for resources again, we are limited as an organization. We are Austin based. We do sometimes do uh, virtual training for folks in other places that need it, but typically we are Austin based. Um, we offer financial assistance on all of our training programs, whether it's private or group classes. Um, we have some really cool speakers coming up who are also part of that Maddie's Fun speaker series, focusing on voices of color or voices of the global majority, um, whichever term fits, uh, fits you best. Um, so we have some really cool presentations coming up. If you go to everydogaustin.org, I will try and get this um, uploaded to YouTube and then sent out tomorrow. Um, and we'll include some of the extra fun goodies that Cassie is going to provide for us, um, including her cash app slash Venmo. Um, so lots of cool stuff coming up. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit. If you like what we're doing and you like these webinars, we would really appreciate a donation. It helps us to continue to provide low cost options for other folks. Um, and if everyone can do me a favor and let folks know about this webinar, let them know about some of the resources that Cassidy talked about today. This is something that is not a one and done. We're not fixing everything by having this conversation. So um, please, please take this into the world um, and make, make some things happen. So um, Cassidy, any final words from you? Anything you want to tell us about Ginger? Ginger, any thoughts? She started. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Thoughts from Ginger. Amazing. Wrap Thank you so up, much, Cassie. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Yeah, I absolutely love being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Y'all have a good night. Bye.